Hello, and welcome to this video for the Physics 132 lab, which is an introduction to the idea of uncertainty. This information is based upon the work by Jay Denker and used with permission. So imagine dropping a ball and timing how long it takes using a watch that's accurate to about a millisecond. I could do the experiment and, for example, get 3.142 seconds. We will call this the indicated time to distinguish it from the true time. The true time that the ball takes to fall is a continuous variable. It can take on any possible value. And that's an infinite number. There's an infinite number of numbers that round to 3.142 seconds. There's 3.142.01, there's 3.141592689794001, and so on and so on and so on. There's a, literally an infinite number, and each one of them could have an infinite number of digits. For all we know, well, this is unlikely, but for all we know, the time that the ball took to fall is exactly equal to pi. The consequence of this is that the true value of the time it took for the ball to fall is not only unknown, it's impossible to know. Any measurement device is going to have some limited degree of precision, and so we can never actually know the true time that the ball takes to fall. Compare this in contrast to, say, a dice roll. You roll a die, it comes up a five. That is a fixed number. There are only fixed options. One, two, three, four, and five. That's it. So, such variables as die rolls are, in contrast, discrete. And this will be important for the notion of uncertainty. So now let's take the ball and drop it several times, say four. This will lead us to the idea of uncertainty. There, is a couple, there are two possibilities. One is that with each drop, I measure a different time. So let's say I get these four observations. The variation in these numbers is the uncertainty. We'll learn how to quantify this a bit later, but for now, all that's important is that the variation in these numbers is the uncertainty. There is another possibility. I get the same value each time. And this might be because the device I'm using has a limited precision. In our example, we measured 3.142. The stopwatch only goes to the millisecond. So even if we got 3.142 each and every time, we might not believe that last digit and assign an uncertainty of a millisecond. So we can either measure it from the variations, or if we can't measure it because our device isn't precise enough, we can assign an uncertainty. Both of these possibilities are examples of statistical uncertainty. They're the intrinsic randomness of continuous variables. Not only the intrinsic randomness, but also the unknowability. So let's repeat the experiment now, not only with my watch, but with your watch. So here are my four observations. Now let's have you repeat them with your watch, and you get these four numbers. And then we'll repeat it again with an atomic clock and some lasers, the fanciest setup we can possibly imagine, and, and we'll get these answers. Now remember, the true time is still actually unknowable, but we're going to assume that the atomic clock and lasers are closer to the true time. Okay? My watch has less statistical uncertainty than your watch does. The variation between the numbers is smaller. You can see they're pretty tightly clumped. However, my watch has a systematic uncertainty. My numbers are always too low. My watch runs slow. This is a systematic effect. This is related to the ideas of accuracy and precision that you've probably seen in other science courses. Your watch is very accurate, assuming the atomic clock and the laser are close to, closest to the true time, your numbers are closer to that true time, and, but they got a lot of spread. They have a lot of statistical uncertainty. Mine, on the other hand, have a small statistical uncertainty. They don't fluctuate very much, but they have a systematic effect that is significant. They lack precision. Now, after all this discussion, it may seem odd, but there actually are numbers that don't have any uncertainty whatsoever. Roll a die, for example, and get a five. That is a data point without any uncertainty. Another example is the conversion factor between centimeters and inches. 
there are exactly 2.54 centimeters to the inch. There, this number is exact, defined, there is no uncertainty in the terms of sig figs, there are an infinite number of significant figures to that value. We'll actually encounter other such values in this course. Uh, one particularly famous is the speed of light. The speed of light is exactly 2997924588 meters per second. Exactly. An infinite number of significant figures, no uncertainty. Because this is actually how the meter is defined. Those examples were a little trivial. Let's find something a little more complex. So imagine you saw this on a chemistry exam and you were asked to balance this chemical equation. A, C8, H18 plus BO2 yields XCO2 plus YH2O, and you're solving for A, B, X, and Y. So what would you give on a chemistry exam? You'd give, okay, A is 2, B is 25, C is 16, and D is 18. A real reaction, however, will never have these numbers. You'll never begin with two parts of C8H18 and 25 parts of O2 and end up with 16 parts of CO2. That will never happen because of non-idealities. We're ignoring that sometimes we'll get carbon monoxide or C60 buckyballs, or if this is in air, we're going to get nitrous oxide effects. However, for most applications, you can ignore these values and treat these numbers to 25, 16, and 18 as having zero uncertainty. And that's good enough. Often there are other uncertainties in your experiments, in your calculations that are much, much bigger, and so you can safely ignore these. So in summary, all continuous variables have some degree of statistical uncertainty. This is due to the intrinsic randomness of the universe and the actual philosophical unknowability of the exact true value of a continuous variable. Sometimes you can measure this uncertainty by looking at the variation within your measurements, but sometimes your measurement device lacks precision and you just need to assign your statistical uncertainty based upon the precision of your device and, and your intuition and understanding of how things work. In addition, measurement devices can have systematic uncertainties. So for example, my watch ran slow. It was precise, but it ran slow. It was systematically off. These types of uncertainties are generally much harder to understand and much harder to get a handle on. You really have to think about it. In our example, how did we find it? We found it by measuring with a different watch and then comparing to a really, really good watch, our laser and atomic clock hypothetical setup, right? But what if we didn't have the laser atomic clock set up? We just had my watch and your watch. How would we know whose watch is right? So you can see that these systematic uncertainties can quickly become the difficult thing to understand. These ideas of statistical and systematic uncertainty are related to the ideas of accuracy and precision that you've seen in other courses. And it's worth pointing out that there are values without uncertainty, such as the speed of light. And then sometimes we treat values of exact if the uncertainty is too small for us to care about, or we, you know, the non-idealities are, are not important, or there are bigger uncertainties that we have to deal with. We might treat as, some numbers as exact. That's fine. And we'll explore how to quantify all of these things in a later video.